Hello and welcome back everyone, we weave online and today I'm gonna continue the story What if Naruto was captured by the leaf? Part 4 If you enjoy this video, please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this, subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload. Now wasting no more time, let's begin. The Sand Ninja Force was getting closer to Konoha. They had 6 more hours to go before they had to stop and set up camp. As the sun went down, they would move more slowly through the dark forests of the fire country. The troops would stop about four hours drive from the village. Konoha would fall if they could just finish this last part of the trip in secret. As they got closer to a forest opening, a scout told them that a leaf ninja was reading an orange book in the middle of the forest. The Jonin who was in charge of one of the columns told his ninja to stop. He was upset that the leaf patrols should have been dealt with by the sound teams. Small groups sent out on both sides to look for traps and ambushes and to spread out the forces a bit for safety. Other columns farther away kept going toward Konoha. A low-level Jonin was sent by the lead Jonin to find out what was going on with this leaf ninja. He wore a mask and had white hair that stood up. His headband was pulled down over his left eye. The man knew the person, so he asked his assistant quietly to look something up in the bingo book. That is Sharingan Kakashi, sir. If he is here they must know about our breaking the alliance and pending attack with sound, he said. This far from Konoha? No, I think we just happened to run into him. If they knew we were coming, they would have kept someone like that closer to the village, the commander said with confidence. The Sand Jonin walked up to Kakashi and was friendly. The Sand Jonin got a smile from Kakashi when he looked up from his book. The only way to tell was by the look on the small part of his face that you could see. Good evening. Kakashi said. You and all of your friends seem to be a little far from the wind country. Might I ask you business here in the fire country? The Jonin thought quickly and was ready with a lie in case something went wrong. We are traveling to Konoha to watch the Keisukeiji's son fight in the Chunin exams, he stated. Kakashi raised an eyebrow and asked, Ah, well, did you bring your tickets with you? The question caught the Jonin off guard. No one had brought up the idea of talking about this. Not right now, he said with a nod of his head, we'll get tickets when we get there. I see, Kakashi said, also nodding. But you would be disappointed. The arena sold out of tickets last week and the Hokage does not allow standing room tickets to be sold. You are making a trip for nothing. Perhaps you should turn around and return to the wind country. As the minutes went by, the sand Jonin became more lost. It looked like this leaf ninja wasn't aware of anything unusual, he also hadn't lowered his book. Um, I'll go pass that on to my friends, we're going to be disappointed huh? He said. As Kakashi turned a page in his book, he said, if you turn back, you'll be sad. If you go past me, you'll be like them. The breeze changed a little at that moment. When the sand Jonin looked past Kakashi, he saw three dead sound ninjas and could smell blood. Weapons and other items that were not taken were searched through the bodies and broken. He turned around and saw Kakashi. What happened to them? Kakashi smiled and looked up again, no tickets. The sand commander was getting tense. It had been almost three minutes since his force had moved. When the guards left, they didn't find anything. Some people had walked around the edge of the clearing but hadn't found anything else. This person was by themselves. They should kill him and move on. The sand Jonin who was seeing Kakashi was scared now. There were hundreds of ninja around the clearing, but the leaf ninja in front of him didn't seem to be scared. That man wasn't a bunshin was clear from the way his feet moved and the branch he was standing on creaked. The sand Jonin chose to do something. He held out his hand and waited for Kakashi to shake it. Okay. I guess we'll just go back then. Thanks for the information. They were friends, of course. Everyone was friendly with everyone else. Kakashi smiled, took the hand that was offered, and shook it. The Jonin with white hair never saw the kanai go through his side. The sand Jonin laughed at the leaf ninja for being so stupid when Kakashi was taken away in a puff of chakra smoke. After a few seconds, explosions under him tore him apart. Damn it, it was all a trick, a shadow clone, muttered the leader of the Jonin. He was sorry to lose such a good man, but they had to find the ninja who made it now. As Kakashi felt the shadow clone spread out, he almost missed a step. It was getting dark above, which meant it would soon be hard to see in the forest. Well, that only bought us a few minutes. Some sand ninja didn't even slow down. He thought, 
We need to warn Konoha and also find a way to slow down these sand ninja. Naruto made no noise. He hadn't even had time to think about his first kill before he was thrown into a war. Kunoichi had just been thrown. It was just like how he had trained. The fact that it killed the sound ninja made him sad. He threw it the same way he had done a thousand times or more in practice. It seemed simple until he heard the enemy grunt. So, when they had to run away, Kakashi just cut the sound ninja's throat like a butcher cutting a side of beef, not giving it much thought. It made me think. Well, my shadow clone slowed some of them down for a few minutes. There are a lot more sand ninja out there. Several hundred minimum, Kakashi told them. Sakura seemed upset. She asked, what should we do, Kakashi sensei? Since they are in the fire country in force and killed my shadow clone, that means we are at war. We fight them as best as we can and find a way to report this back to Konoha. It means one of us should go on ahead while the other three try to slow down the enemy, Kakashi said quietly. I'm staying, Naruto said firmly. I am not abandoning my friends. She said, if Naruto is staying, then I'm staying too. He would do something stupid like get himself killed if I left him behind. I guess that means Sasakai will have to get the message back to Konoha, said Kakashi. Sasakai was not sure, he didn't want to look like a coward right now. The things his brother had said years before suddenly came back to him. Run, run, and cling to life. If he went that way again, he would never stop running. Even though he had done bad things, Naruto and Sakura had not given up on him. They were still with him. The other people could have hit him hard like he would have, but they didn't. They beat him up to show him they could, but then they asked him to be friends. He didn't like it because it took his attention away from his revenge. Even in his dreams, Sakura's words that he couldn't do everything by himself kept coming back to him. He would need the help of at least one woman to rebuild his clan one day. But if he stayed to fight, he might die and lose the chance to get revenge. We used to think it was wrong to think that Itachi might not have to pay for his crimes. It felt even worse to think about running away now. After he was done thinking, Sasuke said, I won't run away this time, Kakashi Sensei. We'll have to find some other method to warn Konoha. As they talked, the team kept jumping through the trees. Kakashi saw that they were getting close to the village outpost where they had stopped on their way out. Yes, they did have a corral with horses, he said. The column caught up to the team in 5 to 10 minutes at most. It took longer for everyone to get moving than that. Kakashi stopped in a good spot close to the top of a hill. This place didn't have as many trees, so you could see the approach a little better. He made a shadow copy of himself that ran straight to the outpost. After that, the Jonin took a food pill to get some energy back. He looked at the group. My shadow clone will take a message to the Legion garrison we stopped at this afternoon. He will have them send a message off by rider back toward Konoha and hopefully alert any patrols we have closer to the village, Kakashi said. We need to buy him enough time for the soldiers to get riders moving. Naruto made a face. This is the second time you mentioned a shadow clone, Kakashi sensei. It's just another bunshin, right? No Naruto. It is a special jutsu that makes a limited copy of me that can do tasks and perform jutsu. It's very draining due to the chakra it needs. It's also a jonin level technique that is forbidden from common use, Kakashi said. But for now, we need to delay the ninja behind us long enough for him to do his job. Once the warning gets out we start playing cat and mouse with these sand ninja. Sakura, Naruto, start setting explosive tags on the bottom of the branches in an arc around us about 30 yards out. Sasakai, get some wires set up just inside of that. Leave us a path out but it will slow down the enemy from overwhelming us too quickly. The genin got to work right away. Naruto was interested in the jutsu, but he had more important things to think about. As the sun went down over Konoha, the hospital was quiet. People who came to visit were sent away so that the night shift could take over. At all times, there was an Anbu guard inside and outside the room where Gara and Eno's still forms were kept. The agent knew right away that the pair's condition was not normal, even though he didn't know much about medicine. The nurse told the person that their brainwaves shouldn't be that low. During the last few shifts, the agent had seen it enough times to notice that the patterns were moving around a bit. He looked at one tonight and was confused by something else. The patterns got bigger and started moving at the same time. 
The sand ninja stopped when they saw the leaf team waiting ahead of them in the dark. After going faster since meeting the shadow clone, the younger ones all looked pretty tired. The leader spread out his troops so that any one jutsu could not kill them. The lead Jonin was more wary of traps than the last time. When he saw the wire between the trees, he stopped about 20 yards away. He yelled, give up, and I promise you will not suffer. Oh? Kakashi asked. That means you plan to kill us quickly I assume? Sakura saw that the sand ninja were trying to flank them and told Kakashi what she saw. The explosive tags were set off by Kakashi. Dozens of tags went off, sending broken tree branches flying into the air. The shrapnel hit dozens of sand ninja in the legs higher up, and the blast hit more down on the ground, killing more before the falling pieces hit them too. The wire net Sasakai had made to protect the team from the ambush was broken when he threw the shuriken to the sides. When Naruto and Sakura saw a group of sand ninja, they threw kanai with more explosive tags on them at them. The forest was shaken by more explosions. Naruto and Sakura went to the other side, while Kakashi and Sasakai charged at each other from the left. Kakashi hadn't told the genin this, but he had planned on both the place and time of the ambush. The blast on top of the hill could be heard for miles and seen for even longer. Someone in the garrison would see the blast and report it, even if they couldn't get the word out. When Sasakai used his phoenix flower jutsu on another group of sand ninja, his ears hurt from the pain. The plan was to kill as many people as possible before they tried to break the contract. He was using up his chakra quickly, but he didn't stop attacking. He avoided a Chunin's throne kanai and saw that at least three sand ninja were attacking Kakashi at the same time. The Uchiha had to dodge even more kanai and shuriken that were coming at him, so he couldn't even call out to his team leader. He couldn't keep track of everything that was thrown at him because it was getting darker. Even though he tried to concentrate, the smoke hurt and made his eyes water. He almost fell over when a blade cut across his leg. He cursed and dodged again but this time he saw that he was moving into a chain of shuriken that he couldn't avoid. He was about to hide his vital signs when he saw where the shuriken would go. He turned around wildly in the air and only got a few small cuts, he thought his vision had changed a little before he realized that his sharingan had probably turned on, right away, he used that to his advantage by getting his own throwing weapons and attacking back, he would throw one kanai or shuriken and then another one as soon as he saw his opponent move. He did more damage when his eyes told him how the other person was going to dodge. He was moving as quickly as he could. He cut and slashed every sand ninja he could find. Sakura was right behind him on his left, calling out targets. It was paying off that they had been in remedial classes together for months. They often had to fight together because no one else would work with them. Even though they were tired from running all day, they pushed chakra into their arms and legs to make up for it and speed up. Both of them moved quickly enough that the sand forces could aim a long-range attack at them. The sand ninja didn't know how to get through the trees, which was another advantage the pair had. The leaf ninja now understood the obstacle course a lot better, it was like moving through the branches of a tree, and now they both used the skill they had learned. Sakura was the attack team's brains. Anyone in the sand who Naruto couldn't quickly defeat, she would attack from behind. The fact that they had never done this before put them at a huge disadvantage, but the terrain and darkness helped. While Sakura moved up from behind and hammered the enemy, Naruto would fight close up and tie the enemy up in a clinch. Naruto or Sakura would take an enemy's weapons pack to fill up their own once the enemy was dead. As much as possible, they went after the lone ninjas and lightly hurt ones, until Naruto was hit in the stomach with a tonto. The enemy ninja were pushed away from Naruto by Sakura's wave of kanai and shuriken. The man was about to run away when Naruto grabbed his leg and stopped him. Someone cut the man's eye out so quickly that he didn't have time to defend himself, he screamed as he fell to the ground in the forest. He took the tonto off of his side and put his hand on the wound, he could already feel the tenant's chakra working to heal his body. The blood was already moving more slowly. The worse his own got the more he could see the demons. They fought for a long time, and his anger grew. But he used it to keep going. Sakura let Kakashi know that Naruto was seriously hurt and that she was running out of chakra. Kakashi was getting tired. He had to take out his Sharingan implant early in the fight, and the drain was making him tired. He saw what Sakura was writing with her hands. They had to get away from each other quickly and find a place to hide and rest. 
As night fell, he could not make as many jutsu and had to fight close up. The hurt sand ninjas around them were crying out in pain. Their plan to hurt as many people as possible might not work out, but there should be enough casualties for the people who aren't hurt to take care of them, so they should be able to get away. What he saw made him afraid something bad might happen. He was about to tell Naruto and Sakura to follow him. Another group of sand ninjas had seen the explosion and come to find out what was going on. The first group of leaf ninjas was split up, and each pair had to decide whether to escape alone or die trying to get back together. Kakashi told Sakura to stop talking to him and go north. He and Sasakai were going to go east and try to catch as many enemies as they could. After that, the pairs went their separate ways. The Jonin in charge of the new column sent several squads after each pair while the rest of his army looked for people who had been lost. The Shadow Clone ran quickly through the forest to get to the town of the garrison. He jerked when he heard the explosion behind him. The clone ran the last mile and called out to the guard as he ran up to the building. He stopped a short distance away so that he could be identified. The guard sergeant frowned as he looked out his window. The blast they heard was not very loud, but the guard on duty called him from dinner to tell him about it. He ran outside when he saw Kakashi from that afternoon. He asked, Sir, what is it? Invasion. The shadow clone let him know. Those rumors you heard about the sand being mobilized were true. They're invading the fire country to go after Konoha. My team is fighting some right now and I need you to use your horses to get an alert to the legions, the daimyo and Konoha. The sergeant knew what was going on and told his men to move. The strict rules that the sergeant had set for his men paid off. In just ten minutes, six horses rode off into the night. A man with white hair was heading north toward Konoha quickly. He got back to the fire country very late because the Hokage had asked him for some information, which kept him busy. The sand was keeping everyone with ties to the leaf from leaving. He had to sneak past them. He saw the first flash of light from the explosion and then more. Since he already knew what it was, this was just confirmation. There was going to be war. He could see new flashes of light moving slowly toward him. He could finally hear the low rumbles of the first blasts. Those tags must have been very strong to be heard this far away. On top of a group of small hills, so the blast could be seen from farther away as well. He bit his thumb and did a summoning jutsu. That means that person over there is a janin or a really smart chunin. As soon as the chakra smoke cleared, a big rust-colored toad appeared in front of him. The toad asked, What do you need, Jiraiya-sama? I need for you to head for Konoha as quickly as you can. Inform the Hokage that my previous message was correct. We have been betrayed. I have seen a battle to my south so someone must have stumbled over the sand army and is trying to do something about it, Jiraiya said with seriousness. Naruto ducked another tag that went off from behind Sakura and him. The piece of tree that hit him this time missed. He made sure to stay between Sakura and the teams that were after them. It made sense that the healthy person would be the one to get away since he was hurt. The thought made him laugh. Sakura would have hit him on the shoulder if he had said that out loud. At least she stopped hitting me in the head, he thought as he pushed himself out of the way of another explosion. Damn, these sand guys aren't giving up. The trees in front of me opened up. A farmstead, he figured out. Leaving cover is not a good idea right now. She ran to the edge of the trees and quickly looked over the fields. There was a lot of light outside because the moon was almost full. No danger in sight. She took out her last explosive tag and put it on a big tree in a clear spot. There's no point in being soft right now, the girl thought. She gave it all the chakra she had left and jumped down just as Naruto came running out of the trees, she hit the ground hard. He fell down, but quickly got back up as the two ran across the open fields. The sand was soft, so they only used enough chakra in their steps to make sure they wouldn't slip. Even though dirt flew up behind them, they ran as fast through the soft dirt of the fields as if they were running down a concrete sidewalk. The tag went off behind them, which made the teams that were after them stop and check for traps as they went around the blast. The running couple had just enough time to get to the other side of the fields and disappear into the trees. Sasakai and Kakashi jumped to a road and ran as fast as they could. They had a head start on the enemy, so they should be able to escape from that group. People on the team hid in some bushes next to the road to catch their breath. The sand would have to deal with too many hurt people to go after them closely. When Kakashi's shadow clone self went away, 
the memories came back to him. The soldiers got an alert moving. I just hope the enemy is not watching the roads for such things already, Sasakai said. We need to find a place to rest for a few hours. The boy asked, what about Sakura and Naruto? Once the enemy separated us, there was not much we could do except hope they got away. Naruto got hurt but should be fine if they can break contact, Kakashi said. And if they can't, then they might not make it, was all Kakashi said in a rough voice. After a long pause, he spoke again. I know it is harsh but that is also a part of being a ninja, Sasakai. Sometimes we kill them, sometimes they kill us. People die in war. Friends die even if you don't want them to. The best you can do is make sure their sacrifice is not in vain. That is something I forgot a long time ago and only now remembering that lesson. Sasakai just gave a nod. My Sharingan activated during the battle. Right now, for some reason I don't understand, it doesn't seem as important as it did at that moment. Kakashi and Sasakai sat still for another 10 minutes before Kakashi gave them the go-ahead to move again. Now that Kakashi had made him work out more over the past few weeks, Sasakai was glad that he had. He might not have a second wind for long. If he had tried this before he joined the team, though, he wouldn't have made it this far. So that they could find the rest of their team, Kakashi turned them so that they were still going north. When Naruto fell hard on a branch, it hurt and he grunted. Running through the trees after getting stabbed in the stomach was not fun at all. Every time he jumped, the wound felt like it was opening up again. He would have been dead by now if he were someone else. He had always taken his healing for granted, but today it was working extra hard. He was able to take a blood pill early on, so that didn't worry him too much. What was making the red haze in his eyes besides blood loss? Even though he should have been out of chakra by now, he kept going. Sakura wasn't in much better shape either. Already, they had to turn around twice to avoid being caught by enemy ninjas. Seeing the moon through the trees was all she had left to guide them at this point. She was in charge. As if he were attached to her, Naruto just followed. She knew he was hurt, but they both couldn't stop. His blood always let them know where they were. People who use sand to track would smell them and follow them. She chose that he would not go down by himself if it came to that. They were stuck in trees and she had to get them down. It would only take the smallest track, but there were only a few ground trails in the almost pure forest. The animal trails were too complicated for the ninja to follow. If Naruto was healthy, he would have no trouble running through trees, but he wasn't. She asked for a break while she climbed higher in the trees to get her bearings. He put a lot of weight on the bole of the big tree. To try to get his breath back, he closed his eyes and took slow, deep breaths. He could run for another hour after just 10 minutes of rest. The time they had was not 10 minutes. The last trap gave them a lead, but each break cut that led down. Sakura let out a frustrated growl, they had no choice but to go back northwest. As soon as they got past the farmstead, they came across the back guard of a third group of sand ninja. After them came teams from the new column. The sand ninja kept making them move faster than they were used to, which used up both leaf ninja's chakra faster than they could heal it. To slow down the sand, the two had to set traps and wait in ambushes. They were constantly being chased, which only got them farther away from their goal. The teen with pink hair thought about taking her last food pill, but she chose to wait until she couldn't travel anymore or was taken to battle. She thought that Kakashi Sensei and Sasakai might have gotten away. Before he got up, Naruto had already kept track of four minutes, he hadn't been this tired since Root. When he looked up, only Sakura's gasp could be heard in the dark. Naruto asked in a low voice, What's wrong, Sakura-chan? Naruto, your eyes are really bright red right now, she said in a lower voice. He replied, Really, I didn't know that because I can't see them, I can barely see through a light red haze. I asked Naruto, What does that mean? Your eyes have never been red before. I think I know why, but I'll tell you later. I can hear them getting closer, the blonde told his partner to take his attention off of her. Do you think Naruto will be able to make it? Came a worried question that he didn't want to think about. I need to make it. I'll be Hokage one day, right? He put on a fake smile and said, I have to get through this to do that. He stood still, and the two of them jumped off the branch into the night, three minutes later a group of sand ninjas landed on that branch. At night, a man on a horse rode down the road, 
He had already warned two garrisons and was told there was a Konoha patrol in the area. He went down the trail toward the town where the caravans had stopped and hoped no one was waiting. Soon after, Naruto and Sakura found the next opening in the trees they were looking for, but it wasn't the way they had planned. They came across the Kayubi Trail. This leads right to the walls of Konoha, Sakura thought. We could be home in a few hours after this. The Kayubi Trail was a destructive line in the forests around Konoha. It was the path the Kayubi had taken from its summoning point to the walls of Konoha. No one went there because nothing would grow there, and sticky pockets of energy hid traps for those who weren't careful. Small Oni flocked to the trail to soak up the energy, but they never stayed for too long because they were afraid of what might happen if they did. The trail was now only made up of the dead trunks of once mighty trees. Sakura stopped on the edge of the trail and caught Naruto as he was about to fall out of a tree. Naruto passed out. Now I can't just run down the trail to Konoha, she thought as she put her teammate on her back. She didn't want to leave him behind. They were being chased, and the half mile to the other side might as well have been a hundred now. They wouldn't make it across without being caught. Sakura jumped to the ground and knelt down in the bushes on the edge of the trail for a moment. Then she went out into the moonlit skeletal trees and the dusty wind. She was about a third of the way across when the sand ninja caught up with her. At least twenty of them waved their shunshin jutsu around her, making it impossible for her to get away. She quickly ate her last food pill, knowing that she might not make it through the next few minutes. It's my turn to protect you, Naruto, she said. Then she threw him to the ground and made him lean on a tree. She had stopped on the edge of the trail and caught Naruto just as he was about to fall off the tree. Naruto was out for the count. Well, I guess I won't be able to just run down the trail to Konoha after all, she said as she put her teammate on her back. She didn't want to leave him behind. It felt like a hundred yards since it was only a half mile to the other side. They couldn't get across without being seen. Took a big jump to the ground. She sat down in the bushes next to the trail and then walked out into the dead trees, where a breeze stirred up the dust. The sand ninja caught up with her after she had gone about a third of the way across. At least twenty people used a shun shinjutsu to move in on Sakura. She looked for a way out, but she couldn't find one. She quickly ate the last food pill, knowing that she might not make it through the next few minutes. She thought, it's my turn to protect you, Naruto. She put him on the ground and had him lean on a tree. Then Sakura jumped to attack. The group Sakura attacked was caught off guard when she pounced on them. She held her last pair of kanai in closed fists, so the points stuck out like she was holding trench knives. One of them took a punch to the jaw, and then the blade went across his throat, making a small noise. She turned on her lead foot and hit another sand ninja in the chest with a back roundhouse kick. When he tried to breathe, the man fell and broke four ribs. As dozens of kanai and shuriken fell on the girl with pink hair, the third man in the group jumped back. When the weapons hit her, blood shot out of a dozen different places on her body. The body changed from a leaf ninja with pink hair to a sand genin with sandy hair. There was a small puff of chakra smoke after this. The group's janin all knew right away what had happened. One person yelled, Kawarmi. On the other side, Someone cried out in pain as another genin fell forward with a kanai stuck in the back of his head. Sakura jumped into the dark with the boy's weapon pouches on her while wind jutsu were thrown at her. A sand shunin knelt down next to Naruto's still body and poked him with a kanai. The blonde boy disappeared in a puff of smoke, and in his place, a bunch of branches showed up. He said, the body was fake, she made some kind of clone. The group was hit by a lot of punai. When captured explosive tags went off in the middle of them, hurting six more sand ninja. As clouds moved across the moon, the invaders ran off into the shadows. As he tried to get through the overgrown forest, Jiraiya cursed as he fell again, because his bigger summons couldn't move through the old growth forest, he didn't use them for now. Many people no longer come this way because the Kayubi Trail is close by. Explosions from far away were happening less often but were louder. He was aware that he was getting near. The sand ninja got back together into teams after a while. Only a few shouts and the painful breathing of the wounded could be heard. Sakura held on to the bottom of a dead branch and had her kanai ready. Along the Kayubi trail, she had gone farther away. A dim red glow came from a pool of chakra close by. The demonic chakra was still there after more than a dozen years, 
but it wasn't bright enough to see during the day. She could see the bones of a dead body in the middle of the pile. That body was one that the Konoha search teams had missed, and it was a focus for the evil chakra. She threw a piece of dead bark that her kanai had broken off to the ground near the glow. A group of sand ninjas charged out of the darkness, but all they saw was another kanai with an explosive tag on it. The blast killed one person and hurt another. The yokai made the explosion stronger and changed the color of the fireball from yellow to red. The color red seemed to move away from the explosion and toward the trail's edge. Someone or something cut Sakura's leg, and she lost her focus on the chakra she was using. She hit the ground and fell. There was a janin waiting for her because she couldn't stop herself. The blast must have lit up my spot, was her last thought as his fist hit her in the face. Sad Sakura woke up in pain. The wrists of her arms were pulled up toward her shoulder and tied behind her back. As the rope around her neck got tighter, she felt a slight tug that almost choked her. She had to force her arms back to where they were before, which hurt, but she was able to breathe again. When she tried to move a leg, she found that they were tightly tied. She thought of a ninja rope. It's stopping the flow of chakra to my limbs. No escape jutsu will work on these. She couldn't see anything because she was wearing a blindfold. A rough voice said, you're not going anywhere, leaf ninja. Answer my questions and you will die without further pain. Sakura did nothing but lay there until the man spoke again. Sit her up, he told her. She was pulled to her knees and made to stand on them by hands she couldn't see. She tried hard to get her arms back where they could let her breathe, but someone behind her grabbed them and lifted her. Sakura moaned in pain and sucked in air greedily. The person behind her took the rope off her throat so she could talk to them. You and your team have led us on a merry chase this evening, it is a shame actually, it will be for nothing. Konoha will fall tomorrow and there will be nothing left but ashes. So our case cage has decreed, the janin smiled. Sakura spoke only a few words, and you are telling a lowly genin this why? The janin laughed, you are no genin, girl, do not insult my men by claiming otherwise. I'm Haruno Sakura, genin of Konohakagor, and I'm happy to meet you, Sakura said in the happiest voice she could muster. That too came out in a dull voice. It seemed like a better way to die than to beg them, since she knew she was going to die anyway. The punch in the back that hit her in the face felt like it broke something. It was too much for her, and she fell to one side. Someone held her up because she would have fallen over without them. She bit her lip and spat blood. As soon as she got back on her knees, she felt more pain. Naruto slowly moved and opened his eyes. His stomach pain was a lot better, and it looked like his chakra was healing itself. The red haze that was blocking his view had also gone away. As he tried to listen, his blue eyes were fixed on the brush that was covering him. He must have passed out and been hidden. As he tried to concentrate, the sounds of people searching got closer. When he put his hand on his wound, it was scabbed over and almost closed. That was one small good thing about being the Kyubi's host. He knew that the fact that he kept running after getting hurt was what kept it open. He could feel it trying to heal for hours, but every sudden jump tore it open again. He had already taken the last blood pill from his first aid kit and was out of food pills. He could barely make out the sound of a girl's scream of pain as she tried to get out from under the brush that was covering him. Sakura's screams could be heard in the dark, but her lungs hurt. The janin cut her shoulder several times with a kanai before she screamed in pain. Her eyes were filled with tears because she could not stay away from it any longer. Are you ready to start answering my question little girl? How many in your squad and where are they? Did you want your village of our approaching forces? The janin said. Haruno Sakura, Genin of Kono. Another groove was cut into her shoulder by the blade. I screamed, Sakura. He said in a low voice, so far I have been kind to you child. If you start to fight me, I will start cutting off parts. She couldn't do anything else because she was in so much pain. One squad, she said in a whisper. I don't know where the others are. We got separated hours ago. Where is your partner? The one whose blood allowed us to follow you. She spoke in a husky voice because her screams were making her throat close up. Yeah I don't know. I hit him when he fell and pretended to have him with me, miles ago. The Jonan asked. Did you tell your village? Sensei's job. He just told us to break contact and try to head back to village, Sakura said. The Janin didn't know what to do. 
they had stumbled into the back of his column and began to chase. It seems that they had lost touch before, but bad luck put them in this situation. The leader of his column had sent his squads to deal with them. It was not worth it for Lone Genin to lose four people and be too hurt to keep fighting. This is what a Konoha Genin should be like. What about a Chunin and a Janin? Not many of their elites were very good, and they wouldn't be able to make a big difference in the next battle. He was already going to be late. Three hours of wasted time looking for the bad guys. He sighed. While this girl was younger, he wasn't really a pedophile. That was not possible. He finally said, we're done here. That's what he meant by, Chunin, behind the girl with pink hair. The older teen agreed, then pulled Sakura's head back so that his blade could cut her throat. The moon came out from behind the clouds and cast a soft white light over the area. When the moonlight touched the girl's pink hair, it looked like it was glowing. There was a shout in the dark that said, Sakura-chan. Naruto got out of the bushes without letting the people searching the area know he was there. He walked out into the empty, dead trees, being careful not to stir up the dust as he went. His side hurt, but after the short break, he could move around without any trouble. He went toward where he thought the screams were coming from. It was his desire to run to Sakura, but he knew he was outnumbered and that getting caught now would be bad for both of them. Each cry and whimper from his teammate made his heart race and his resolve weaken. As he got closer, he saw the man questioning Sakura make a throat-cutting motion to the man behind her. The moon came out from behind the clouds and cast a soft white light over the area. When the harsh light hit the girl's pink hair, it looked like it was glowing. He could see Sakura's bloody face and the way the light bounced off of her shirt, which was stained with blood. He could no longer keep his anger in check. Even though he could see better in the dark, the red haze over his eyes came back. His only goal was to kill these men. Kill all of them. They were punished for hurting Sakura-chan. He yelled, Sakura-chan, as red power shot out of his body. The Jonin turned around and saw a blonde-haired teen. The boy's eyes made him stop for a moment. They shone. Just before a blast of red energy surrounded the boy, their pupils were slit and their eyes were red. From points on the ground hundreds of yards away, red lightning rods rose up and joined the swirling light. The boy was hit by a wave of energy that looked like the head of a kid backquote. It felt like a cloak around the boy as he ran forward. The Chunin who was about to kill the girl screamed and ran away. The girl fell to the ground in a cloud of dust. He's like Garasama, the Janin thought as he died. A lot of people in Konoha who were sleeping woke up scared. The living and dead leaf ninjas who had fought the Kayubi shook because they were woken up from their sleep. Guards on the wall that faced the Kayubi trail said they saw a blood-red light rise in the distance and then go out of sight. Now that he was fully awake, the Hokage added more guards to the walls and for a moment thought about delaying the finals of the Chunin exam for the next day. He felt the chakra go away again after a few minutes, and the feeling went away too. What did you do to need to use the Kayubi chakra, Naruto? He thought. He told his guards to warn the town militia and reserves to be extra careful for the exams. Tomorrow, a good number of the fire daimyo's court lords and several dozen from other areas would be there. He wasn't going to let anything happen by chance. Calling off the tests just hours before they were due would be seen as a weakness which he could not afford for Konoha right now. He sighed and turned to get dressed. The first signs of dawn could be seen in the eastern sky. He had a long day coming up. Naruto looked around with his red eyes. Besides the Chunin who had dropped Sakura and was running away, there was no one else within 50 yards. He looked down at the Jonin's body but didn't feel anything. He now had claws on his hand instead of fingernails for some reason. There was blood on his hands, but he didn't care right now. What was around him made him feel strong. Seeing Sakura whine in pain drew him out of his rage. She looked at him with green eyes that were both amazed and a little scared. He used the Janin's kanai to cut the ropes that were holding Sakura's arms in place. It hurt a lot for the girl with pink hair to move her arms into a comfortable position in front of her. Naruto, how? She started, but he cut her off with a look. He only said, later, as he watched the sand ninjas gather about 100 yards away as they ran away. She tried to stand up, but her legs weren't strong enough to hold her yet. Her limbs felt like pins and needles as blood and chakra came back to them. This made her hiss in pain. When he saw the sand ninja moving around and closing in again, he became fully aware again. 
Naruto took a quick look at Sakura. The enemy would attack before she could get ready to fight again. Naruto could see so well at night at that moment. He wanted to fight, but he knew he wasn't strong enough and Sakura couldn't fight or protect herself anymore. He had to keep her safe. In tactics class, we were always taught that a single ninja trying to defend a fixed point against many other ninjas would fail. Even though it made him feel bad, he grabbed Sakura and ran down the trail toward Konoha. Three groups of sand ninjas came after them, but they stopped quickly because they were told to and were afraid of that strange red chakra. Sakura's neck and face were stung by Naruto's red chakra, but she didn't say anything. She looked ahead. The moonlight made the dead trees look creepy and strange. A trail of red light lit up behind Naruto as he ran. The girl could see a line of red chakra following them. Lightning bolts of red chakra shot up from the burned ground and hit the mass, which seemed to slowly form a comet-like tail behind him. She put her thoughts aside and worked on getting her arms and legs to work properly again. It felt a little better when she moved her fingers around, pointed her toes, and flexed them. They had only gone a mile before they were attacked again. Once more, the clouds moved in front of the moon and blocked most of Naruto's view. However, he could still see better than usual in the dark. The two Jonin who were waiting for them in front of them set up a simple tripwire, but he missed it. Naruto threw Sakura into the air and rolled along with his fall. She then had a rough landing, but she wasn't hurt anymore. Naruto was breathing heavily and looked like he was going to pass out again. Now that he was stopped, the red aura around him was slowly going away. He thought, I'm still low on chakra, and this red stuff is making me sick. It seemed to get energy from the area around it every once in a while. A little brighter, then going back to being dim. As the two Jonin closed in on the tired pair, Sakura moved closer to Naruto. As the tags went off between the pairs, explosions blinded the genin. That is far enough, said a voice. As something big hit the ground, dead branches crashed to the ground. The moon came out from behind a cloud again to shine on a toad the size of a house. Why are allies attacking allies in the middle of the night? The man on top of the toad asked in a loud voice. He had a long bush of white hair behind him, and a big scroll hung over the end of it. Naruto stood there, out of breath, and tried to guess what would happen next. The two sand Janin were getting ready to attack when the toad's tongue came out and knocked them both out. The toad ate both men and then disappeared as one of the men told the amphibian to be quiet. When the man with white hair turned to face them, Naruto and Sakura both fell down. Darn, I couldn't even give these two my entrance dance. That's a shame because it's so good, Jiraiya grumbled out loud as the moonlight lit up his face. He quickly looked at the teen's wounds while kneeling next to them. After that, he made some signs with his hands, and they lit up green. Before putting it over Sakura's shoulder, he ran it back and forth over her. The cuts healed, leaving behind only pale skin to show that they were there. After that, he took care of her cuts in the mouth and face, but the bruises stayed there, though they were less noticeable. He turned to Naruto and thought, I'm not as good as Tsunade, but I can do small things like cuts. He's just as tired as the girl. He was drawing on the Kyubi's chakra, so it had to be something important. These kids were in danger from those sand janin. This has to do with what I found in the wind country. He tried to wake the teens up normally, but neither of them moved while he was taking the test. Both of them had chakras run out and food pill overdoses. They're going to sleep for a long time. I should go back to Konoha right away. Jiraiya called up a new toad and put the teens on its back before joining them. Unless I call Gamabunta, it will already be four or five hours before we get to Konoha. I think he would be too tired to play taxi. I may also need him later. When a rider on a sweaty horse got to the gates of Konoha, the parade of daimyos in their ceremonial ox-drawn carriages was over. The man had left his first horse behind a long time ago. This was the fourth horse of the night for the rider. Along the path he was taking, other riders had sent alerts to Legion barracks. The low sergeant knew a few things about ninjas and forces. The Legion couldn't do much to stop the estimated number of ninja who were after Konoha at this point. The soldiers could do damage to the sand forces, but if they went up against a large group of regular soldiers, the ninja's jutsu would wipe out the battlefield and win. Konoha would have to get by without any help. At least the low sergeant was happy that his message got through. Serutobi frowned at the message that the Anbu had brought. 
He was upset that he had to miss the tournament, but a shadow clone should be able to step in. He wasn't likely to be asked to fight inside Konoha's walls. He gave it more thought. If the sand forces were going to attack, why would the case cage be in the stadium where he could be captured, he thought. At first glance, it seemed like the man was too sure of himself and even cocky, but that wasn't like what the case cage Serutobi had been up against for more than 10 years. There had to be a trick to him. Wrath knew that today would be a big day. He started giving orders to the people he was in charge of. The Sand General was ready a mile from Konoha's walls. His force would start its attack as soon as the signal was given. Ninjas from Sound Village would attack from the other side of the leaf. They were going to meet at the stadium after killing everyone in their way. Then, if Gara was awake, they would save him or kill him if he couldn't do anything. His only worry was about the leaf ninja that three different columns had seen. All of them said that contacts had been cut off, but that his own forces had suffered a lot of casualties. His attack power had dropped by almost 15% because few people were killed and many were hurt. It took a second to get each wounded ninja to a safe place. The ninja who was accompanying would be free later, but not for the first strike. Kakashi showed Sasakai the way to the northwest. To get to Konoha directly, there were too many groups of sand ninja, so Kakashi chose to look for his teammates who had gone missing. Now that it was dawn, the two had found the often weak trail of their teammates who were missing. About every five miles, the remains of an ambush were seen, and the trail had to be found again. Sasakai asked Kakashi, how did they get so far on their own? Both of them were washouts and Naruto had a stab wound. You keep judging them based on you academy days, Sasakai. They have already proven they have greatly improved since then. Stop deluding yourself. They got stronger because they put in the effort to get stronger. Naruto has a way of bringing out the best in people and it worked with Sakura. She got over her fangirl attitude and realized how much more she could be by working for it. Naruto only needed someone to put things in a simpler form. Basic military training is just that. Simple single steps to achieve a larger whole. HN, so he isn't that smart and needed a fool's guide to learn how to be a good ninja, Sasakai laughed as he ran away. For a short time, Kakashi stopped to rest, he had to quickly nip Sasakai before he made him mad too. Sasakai, he said harshly, Naruto is neither an idiot nor slow. He was simply never taught properly. Think about how often he was even allowed to participate in class. To my own shame I allowed some of the things that happened to him. He was intentionally taught taijutsu that would have left him dead against a skilled opponent. His ninjutsu teacher tried to teach him a suicide jutsu instead of the replacement jutsu. He has too much chakra and not enough control to even think about most genjutsu. That he was able to overcome those and many more obstacles to get as far as he has gotten is a clue that he had the potential to be so much more than he is now. You keep claiming that people are holding you back but the one person who truly can claim that is Naruto. Even so, he never complains and keeps trying his best. You were and still are given more than ample opportunities to excel but you just keep saying you are being held back. The only thing holding you back is your own selfish attitude. If you had Naruto's work ethic, you would already be a chunin. Instead you piss and moan about your brother killing your family and how you need more power to kill him. If you truly wish to kill him, you need to learn that the only way to reach his level is to walk the same path to strength that Itachi did. I watched him grow, Sasakai. He has the same work ethic that Naruto does. Every bit of his strength, he got through sweat and pain and blood. He rarely used his Sharingan to gain skills because he knew even at age 8 that he would not understand the best way to use that strength simply by copying it. He knew that simple power was no replacement for earned skill. Kakashi stopped his rant to look at the sun. Sasakai, until you learn the difference between power and skill, nothing anyone teaches you will ever be enough, he said. We need to move. We've been sitting here for too long. Kakashi then jumped at the chance to move again. Sasakai moaned, but he followed. In the same way, Kakashi had told him the first day they worked together. Some of what the man said made a lot more sense after what happened the night before. He thought about many things still. It was exciting to see the first fight of the Chunin exam. Tenten and Zaku's battle came to an exciting end. As the sound genin charged his jutsu from 20 yards away, Tenten blocked the air holes in his arms with kanai. After that, he fell quickly. They fought again in the second match. 
The attack was harsh and quick. He hit Lee close up with his melody arm attack. It was something no one had ever seen before, and it knocked out the boy in the spandex. Lee was taken to the hospital right away because his eardrums had burst and he was bleeding inside. Choji and Konkuro fought in the third match. Konkuro's tools and poisons were too strong for Choji to handle. It was too late for Choji after he was poisoned. Neji and Shikamaru fought in the fourth match. Neji talked about fate and destiny to scare Shikamaru. But Shikamaru got bored and fell asleep while standing up. After that, Hayate called the match. The people laughed at Neji, which made him feel bad. The shadow copy of Serutobi kept telling the K's cage nice things. When the man didn't seem to be interested in Konkuro's performance, the clone asked where Uchiha Sasakai was. The only thing the line of thought did was show Serutobi that this was not the K's cage. The clone told everyone he had to go to the bathroom for a short time. Once the shadow clone got to the bathroom, it called up another one that disappeared right away so it could teach Serutobi everything it had learned so far today. The Anbu guard who was with him gave the clone a special pill that would give it energy and help it stick together for a few more hours. The clone then pretended to have a slight limp and went back to the observation box. Ah, the penalties of age, Case Cage Dono. I pulled something playing with the grandson last week, the copy said. The Case Cage said in a smooth, soft voice, you should really retire, Hokage Dono. You are not a young man anymore. He laughed and said, oh, there are still a few more fights in this old frame of mine. They fought in the first semi-final match, Tenten and Konkuro won. Tenten's skill with weapons was too much for Konkuro to handle with just one puppet. Konkuro threw the puppet at her instead of using it to defend herself to get the win quickly. With her twin rising dragons technique, she was able to attack both the puppet and him at the same time. Konkuro couldn't defend himself from the weapons because the puppet wasn't close to him. After that, Hayate stopped the fight while medics rushed to stop the bleeding. A loud noise came from the eastern wall of Konoha just as the second semifinal match was about to start. A huge cloud rose, and in the space it left, a three-headed snake the size of the Hokage Tower appeared. The invasion by Konoha had begun. Kakashi and Sasuke had a little trouble finding Naruto and Sakura's trail. It was easy to follow the trail. The problem was that a lot of hurt sand ninja were being helped along by their friends. Already, the two had to avoid a dozen hurt people while their guard helped them move. During each detour, Sasuke got mad at how good the two dropouts had become. At this point, even he had to agree that they were pretty good. They were so far ahead because he fell so far behind. Getting in trouble with Kakashi did not make things better for him. Even though it hurt his pride, he couldn't come up with a single answer to anything Kakashi said because it was all true. In the early morning light, Kakashi saw that Sasuke's face was serious. They had both had a rough night. When Sasuke found out he wasn't as good as he thought he was, it opened his eyes so much. The battles and being awake for more than 24 hours slowed down the mind and stopped any delusions. Kakashi had to deal with his own demons again, but this time he did. He didn't like the thought of Naruto and Sakura being dead, but he knew it was possible. He had only been their Jonin sensei for a little over two months, but he realized that he did like them. It hurt because they made him think of Obito and Rin. But this time, the pain was good. Over a dozen years had gone by while he just existed because he couldn't move on. In the short time he knew them, the genin taught him a lot. He realized that crying in front of a monument for friends who had died was an insult to those friends. To honor the life his teacher and friends who had died had given him, he should live it. They stopped at one more place to hide and saw a larger than usual group of sand ninja coming up behind them. This group had more hurt people than healthy people. Kakashi told Sasuke to stand to the side while he watched them. Some of the sand ninja looked like they were about to lose it. Kakashi knew they had seen something bad even though they were far away. It made sense now what he felt earlier about the Kyubi chakra. They tried to hurt Naruto and Sakura, so he used the power of the tailed beast against them. The Jonin waved his hands to tell Sasuke to go north and go around the group of sand ninja. Not long after meeting, they came up to the Kyubi trail. Sasuke did nothing but look out at the half-mile-long stretch of dead trees in front of him and on both sides that went out to the horizon. 
Whoa, he said to himself. Kakashi replied with a nod. Whoa indeed. This is the path the tailed beast Kayubi no Yoko took 13 years ago on its way to Konoha. The land along this path was poisoned by its chakra. The devastation doesn't spread but residual chakra in the area keeps new growth from filling it in. The man gave a sideways point. There, signs of a recent battle, said he. While Kakashi used what he had learned from Anbu to quickly follow the flow of the battle, the two looked into the area. He frowned when he saw the bloody rope, but he was glad it was cut. In that case, the person who had been locked up was set free. He found out that the freed person was being taken to Konoha. The tracks looked funny, but they were still easy to follow. They were getting near. After a few minutes, the last battle site was found. Kakashi was shocked to see the big mark in the dusty ground. It could only have been a big call. Sasuke asked, what's wrong? They were rescued. It appears that the Sanin, Jiraiya the Toad Sage was here and found our missing duo. He would be heading back to Konoha. We should be doing that as well. In the hole it made in the wall of Konoha, a huge snake with three heads showed up. There were too many sound ninja for Konoha ninja to handle, so they ran away from the breach. Other than the squad in the wall at that point, there were no other Konoha victims in the area. The case cage grabbed Serutobi's shadow copy and jumped to the top of the box where the two of them were sitting. He wanted the arena's leader to die in front of everyone. Four guards for the case cage jumped around them and started making hand signs at the same time. In an instant, a wall went up around the quartet. The man in the blue case cage robes put a kanai to his throat to stop the anbu while the barrier hardened. The shadow copy of Serutobi said in a funny voice, so, it's begun. The case cage looked down at Serutobi and grunted in confusion. What do you mean, Hokage Dono? You can drop the act, my wayward pupil. You were Orochimaru not the case cage, the clone said. A soft laugh came from the man in the cloak. So what exactly gave it away, Serutobi sensei? You're such a bad actor, Orochimaru, the clone said with a smirk while raising one hand in the air and calling out to the Anbu guards near the box. Two of the masked and robed guards ran away, and two more moved toward the energy wall's edges. I had not thought you would use a chakra barrier wall, Orochimaru. But all this for an attack on me. A pity really, you had such potential as a child. Where did it all go wrong? The clone said. As Orochimaru raged, I should have been made Hokage, not that Namikaze whelp. I had done everything right. I waited an extra decade for you to retire. My teammates both ran off while I stayed and I was next in line to be Hokage. Suddenly he was there and took the place I had earned. You never had the people of Konoha in mind when you wanted the position. You wanted the power of the job, my errant pupil. Minato always wanted what was best for the ninja and people of Konoha in his heart. You had no feelings for others. You even tortured your own apprentice. I was trying to make better ninja, Serutobi sensei. I realized that all the techniques in the world are limited by one thing, the flesh we are all made of. It is the weakness. It needs improving before one can learn all there is to know. The Serutobi clone said in a bitter tone, with all of your experiments and all of the deaths you have caused, all you have done is destroy your own humanity. But at least I can do something to atone for that. It ends today, Orochimaru. Orochimaru laughed and asked, Oh, how do you plan to do that, Serutobi sensei? The clone said, like this, right before he went off. At the walls of Konoha, waves of explosive tags flew at the huge snake with three heads. The summons didn't seem to mind the explosions. They stung the snake, but it wasn't hurt enough to be really dangerous. The snake was mostly fought by military ninjas with the rank of Chunin. They did what they were told and kept running away from the huge summon. There was a lot of damage to property, but people had been evacuated hours before. To fight the snake, stronger weapons were being brought up. Awaiting them was Serutobi near the western wall of Konoha. The one Anbu squad was sent to help on the eastern front. But he knew that the balance of forces would be needed here in the west, so he didn't send more help to the eastern part of the village to fight the snake. He knew this because Anbu agents who were watching the staging camp for sound said that most of the ninjas there were not very good at Chunin. It looks like Orochimaru didn't trust that many strong ninjas to work for him without some kind of supervision. 
The military ninja could easily deal with a group of that strength. The call had changed that. Based on what the Legion sergeant said, the sand forces closing in were between 100 and 2,000 strong. On his way to Konoha, the man had ridden all night and driven six tired horses. The man would not have been able to report in if he did not have Kakashi's ID codes. According to Kakashi's report, the enemy force was well balanced and had a lot of Jonin level enemies. The old leader cursed as the village heard the explosion at the arena. Because it was in an impossible situation, his clone seized the chance to fight Orochimaru. He might not know if his student is still alive right now. A guard at the wall called out, Hokage-sama, we have a runner from the northwest station. He reports a large toad approaching the village down the Kayubi trial. Asahi thought, Jiraiya is finally here. Have Jiraiya brought to me the moment her arrives. He told me. The runner turned around and went back to the wall. Araya cursed again as the toad made another long jump toward Konoha, the hidden village. It took longer than he thought it would. Because both teens were still asleep, the toad had to move more slowly or risk them falling off. Only the toad sage could keep the three people on the toad at this point. The toad made it to the top of the wall with its last jump. A group of chunin waved at him to get the sage's attention. Jiraiya-sama, Hokage-sama has asked that you report to him immediately. He is at a staging area in the southwestern part of the village, someone said. In the last few miles of his trip, smoke started to rise from the village. Now, Jiraiya looked out over the village to figure out what had happened. The huge snake with three heads could be seen from miles away, even during that battle. Even though it was morning, he knew he couldn't rest yet. Chunin, he told the person who had talked to him. He pointed to Naruto and Sakura who were both out of it and badly hurt. Get these two to an aid station right away. They've been fighting their way back from the Sand Ninja all night. Make sure they get good care. I'll check on them later, Jiraiya told the Chunin with a glare that hinted at killing intent. He knew that many people in Konoha didn't think much of Naruto, so he thought that a small threat might work. I will, Jiraiya-sama, the Chunin, who was now sweating, said. The man stood there and watched Jiraiya run eastward. That big toad on the wall stayed put and rumbled, I'll carry these two. Show me the way. The Chunin did nothing but nod and point. Orochimaru moved around and felt pain. Get rid of that old man. He thought, a shadow clone the whole time, and I didn't even notice. What was the point of practicing that jutsu for someone as old as a fossil? He quickly noticed that one of his eyes wasn't opening. The snake Sanin forced himself to sit down by grunting hard, but he couldn't because he didn't have any arms. Orochimaru got a sense of how close he had been to death when he saw the burned arm stumps. Because the ends were sealed, he didn't bleed out while he was unconscious. Over Konoha, the roar of the huge summon with three heads could be heard. He almost laughed until he realized the sound was one of pain, not victory. As the summon was sent out, the sound of air exploding could be heard. It looks like even the battle snake lost. How is it possible? They were supposed to not know. I should have been Vic. With the burned head of Orochimaru in his hands, the Anbu squad captain stood back up to sheathe his ninja too. He and his partner worked quickly to get the body to the T&I morgue. The person in the mask looked at the damage to the roof of that row of seats. Three of the four people who built the wall died in the blast. The big kid was still alive, but it didn't look like he would make it. As soon as possible, he told his team to get the bodies. He was grimly happy to see that the ninja who was at the finals had already made sure that the arena and the daimyos were safe. The giant snake was gone, leaving only the rising cloud of chakra smoke in the east. The military ninja got heavy ballista from the armory and then struck one head with all of their attacks. The heavy bolts went right through the snake's hide, hurting it badly and almost blinding one head. The snake didn't want to stay and die with those wounds, so it went back home. The sound ninja quickly learned why Konoha ninja were thought to be some of the strongest in the area. The sound ninja were being cut down like wheat being harvested from the front and both sides. They also didn't have their main weapon with them. Not many people got the chance to give up, but those who did were not killed. Even fewer were able to get past the walls. When Jiraiya got to where the Hokage was, 
he saw his teacher wearing full battle armor and having a bad mood. Ah, Jiraiya-kun, you made it. For once, you know what time it is, the old leader said. He showed a village map on the ground. The presence of so many Anbu on the walls have delayed the attack by the sand forces. Scouts report hundreds are out there with messengers moving between groups. Going with what we know about sand tactics, there are roughly seven battle squadrons there. Jiraiya also looked sad now. My information said they were coming with ten battle squadrons. During the night, I had noticed many explosions along the line they were supposed to be traveling along and came across a pair of your genin right around dawn, a pink-haired girl and a blonde boy. They were both exhausted and wounded. He looked at his student and quickly nodded. It was on purpose that Jiraiya pretended not to know who the boy was. They are a part of Kakashi's squad. He had sent word with a legion messenger late yesterday. The man arrived early this morning on horse driven near to death. They had found a missing patrol murdered and would try to intercept what they could and harass the sand before breaking contact. It didn't look like Kakashi was with them, Sensei, but when I found them, Pinky and Blondie were fighting two sand Janin. Both of them were badly hurt but still not giving up. Jiraiya spoke a little louder to make sure everyone in the area could hear him. Sarutobi gave a wry smirk. He could feel the mood in the command post getting a little better. Jiraiya had always been good at being in charge, but he liked staying out of the way. Jiraiya-kun, come with me to check out the sand positions. They look like they're waiting for some kind of signal, but it hasn't been given yet. If we do this right, we can avoid a big battle here, Serutobi told Jiraiya. Jiraiya was pulled closer by the Hokage as they walked. Now, the part where you not telling me for people to overhear. We felt the chakra of the Kayubi early this morning. He frowned for a moment to get his thoughts in order. I know, I was a lot closer to it than you folks here. Okay, late yesterday I was making my way here. The sand borders had been sealed and I had a heck of a time getting out. That is why I'm so late. I noted a large explosion on a hill way off to the south of me. I sent a toad on ahead and I turned south to see what was going on. Serutobi walked in and said, the toad didn't arrive, it must have been stopped. Jiraiya said yes and went on. I noticed more explosions during the night as I continued south and they kept moving north. I guess it was a fighting retreat by those two. A little before dawn, there was a massive release of the Kyubi's chakra near the Kyubi trail. I headed directly for that. I finally arrived just as the kids were standing up to those Jonin. I stopped and captured the Jonin, but the kids collapsed before I could ask them anything. If nothing else they had been moving on sheer willpower. He quickly finished up when he saw that they were getting close to the wall. At some point, the girl had been captured and tortured. I found six cuts in her arm and shoulder that fit that description. I think that set off the boy, and he tapped into the demon's chakra. I used what medical jutsu I know to heal up the cuts. No sense in a cute teenager like that being badly scarred. She'll have enough problems from that experience already without those. I left orders for them to be taken to an aid station near where I got into town. Seru Tobi gave another nod. Good. But no signs are Kakashi or the Uchiha boy, huh? No, Sensei. There is no sign at all, the Toad Sage said. Someone came up and yelled. Hokage-sama. The man stopped and quickly bowed. Hokage-sama. The attack on the eastern part of the city has been broken. The sound forces there are in full retreat. Also, Anbu reports from the arena say they have taken the head of Orochimaru. Even though Serutobi was ready for the news that Orochimaru had died, it still shocked him. Up until the moment it went off, he could remember his clone, but he was afraid that Orochimaru would have found a way to stay alive, just like he always did. He remembered the picture of his new student from almost 40 years ago. When he thought about his lost student, he would always see that child in his mind. But deep down, he knew that the boy had turned into a monster. That became clear when they thought about the lab under Konoha. Hokage-sama? The messenger asked, breaking through his thoughts. He turned around and saw the man waiting for orders. Yes, very good. Relay orders to the Janin. Push the sound out of our village. Pursue only a quarter mile past the wall in singles. Full teams only beyond that point. Accept surrenders but no mercy if they resist, the Hokage said loudly. The messenger ran off to tell someone what to do. 
Jiraiya was shocked as he looked at Serutobi. The old man had a smile on his face that would have made Naruto's prankster self proud. Exploding Shadow Clone. He had his arms wrapped around it with a kanai to its neck. The Toad Sage gave his teacher a wary look for a moment before nodding. What about the sand? If it was Orochimaru here, then what of their case cage? The Hokage said, that's what we're going to ask them. At first, sand got into the hospital through cracks and windows and made its way to Ino and Gara's still bodies. The brainwaves stayed in sync, and Ino's levels were rising toward those of awaking people. Now the general in charge of the sand ninja was really stressed out. The attack order never came, and the scouts said there was fighting on the east side of the leaf. They were facing a wall with more than twice as many defenders as usual, along with the Chunin, they could see many Jonin and masked Anbu agents. He had always thought it was a bad idea to attack and destroy the leaf. The sand might not be on the daimyo of the Land of Wind's side right now, but they were still in better shape than they were before they made the deal with the leaf. But the case cage told him to, so he and his ninja did what he said. Listen up, sand forces. This is the Hokage, a voice could be heard from the walls of Konoha. Where is your case cage? The person who was here in Konoha was Orochimaru impersonating him. So, I ask again. Where is your case cage? The general looked round at his captains, not sure what to do. Why wasn't the case cage here? The leaf had to be playing a trick on them. The case cage had come to this place. It was his job to send the signal. There was a big problem here. The case cage had said that Gara's rampage inside the leaf would be the second sign to attack, but that also hadn't happened. We have the three children of the case cage in custody right now. We have already destroyed the sound forces attacking our eastern wall and our best ninja are waiting here on this one. We have no desire to destroy your force but we will do so if you attack. Send a representative to speak with us and we may be able to resolve this without further bloodshed. When the general heard what the Hokage said, it hurt his pride. He knew that Gara had stayed in Konoha after the first part of the Chunin exams, but the case cage had told him that it was to keep their brother company. Tamari and their daimyo had arrived together. The sand village could not last under the rule of the Yandaimi case cage if he was also trapped. He looked at his top commander, we will send a representative. I will go and find out what is going on. If I have not sent back the correct message within the hour, then I am either dead or captive. Get everyone prepared to fall back to the rally point then return to Suna. No matter what, Suna must live on. Throwing our lives away against their wall will only destroy our homes and families in the end. Before going to the leaf village, the general stood up and made a few small changes to his headband. When his blue eyes opened, he saw the tense fabric moving above him. Naruto gasped and sat up, but a pain in his stomach made him lie back down again. A medic who came over told him, Uzumaki-san, you must lie still. Your wounds have been taken care of. Sakura-chan, Naruto said in a weak voice. Her arm and shoulder. Sand ninja cut her up badly. Those have been tended to as well, Uzumaki-san. Jiraiya of the Sanin brought you both back to Konoha. In fact, the being who brought you to us was insistent on waiting around to ensure both of you were well cared for, the doctor said with a forced smile. As Naruto's vision got better, it was clear that the medic was nervous. It became clear that there was a huge battle toad behind the medic. Your belly wound looks like it was taken care of before you got there. It may have done some damage to your insides, so you should stay still, the medic said in a calmer tone. Jin looked over and saw Sakura lying on a cot nearby. Even though she had bandages on most of her wounds, you could see that her face was badly bruised. Naruto was surprised by how clear her skin was after the blood was washed off her shoulder. Someone used medical ninjutsu on her before she arrived, Uzumaki-san. It can heal with minimal scarring if done early enough after damage. I believe Jiraiya-sama did so when he rescued you both. Naruto did nothing but nod and lie down. He fell asleep again because he was so tired. The leader of the sand ninjas went to the western wall of Konoha and went through the big gate. It was only open long enough for Serutobi, Jiraiya, and two Anbu bodyguards to get out before it shut back up. One look at the man showed that he was about middle-aged and in good shape. His tan uniform stood out in the sun, but it was easy for him to blend in when it got dark. As soon as the man got close, Serutobi asked him sharply, Where is your case cage? Mr. Hokage, he should be here. As far as we know, 
he was at the exam finals, the general said. That you feel the need to ask for him gives me pause and is of grave concern to me. There was a man here dressed as your leader. His name was Orochimaru. He was a traitor and missing ninja from Konoha, and he was also the leader of the new sound village, Serutobi growled. The sound forces attacking our eastern walls have been routed and mostly destroyed. If you have broken your alliance and intend to attack us, we shall destroy your forces here. Hokage Dono, all I know is we were ordered to attack by our K's cage, but we believed him to be here. If he is not here, then Suna has a greater problem than we imagined. Take your troops out of the land of fire, and let's talk about it, Serutobi said in a manner that made arguing impossible. The Sand General frowned, but he knew he couldn't do anything about it. He was the most important military officer for Suna after the K's cage. He knew this plan wasn't going to work, so he decided to give up and get his remaining troops out of there without any damage. His only words were, we will withdraw, and then he took a few steps back and turned to leave. When Serutobi made a move, the gate opened just enough for his group to get back inside Konoha's walls. In just a few minutes, the Hokage met with the Jonin commanders. Delegate three Jonin teams to monitor the Sand Ninja as they pull back. If they do anything else, ensure their safety and report in. Who are we missing in that quadrant? A military Jonin said, Sir, aside from the missing patrol you sent Kakashi out to trace, we have two more patrols in that region. Both had checked in yesterday and had no report. Serutobi agreed and said, send them messages. They should stay away from the Sand Ninja and meet up with the Jonin teams that are being sent. Once the border stations are back up and running, we'll start talking to the Sand Village. Soon, a Chunin was running to the aviary to send the messages. Jiraiya said, I brought in two Genin from Kakashi's team. They're at an aid station in the northwest part of the village getting treatment. They were both unconscious from wounds, chakra depletion and food pill overdoses. I found no trace of Kakashi or the other team member. Serutobi gave a nod. However, given your speed on your summons and the distance involved, I would not expect them to return to Konoha before late evening, but more likely tomorrow morning. That is if they do not pause to rest. If my calculations are correct, they would have been moving and fighting for nearly 36 hours already. Even with food pills that is pushing well beyond a Genin's reserves. Dispatch a recovery team with a medic back along Jiraiya's path. If Kakashi is alive he will try to recover his Genin and be tracking them. How are things as far as sound prisoners and casualties go in that area? Serutobi asked as he looked to the east. A second Jonin said, Our casualties are very light, Hokage-sama. Initial numbers indicate under 30 severely injured or dead. Your orders to evacuate the civilians and to fall back at overmatched served us well. We were able to hit them much harder with greater force than if we had needed to protect civilians. Property damage is extensive in the battle areas but limited to those areas. Sound forces suffered a near total loss to those that entered the village. Force count remaining is unknown but not considered a threat as few Jonin have been seen and no ninja above B class has been reported. Serutobi gave a grim nod. It bothered him that people died for no reason. He wouldn't give up on this, though. Press the sound forces that remain. Accept surrenders but crush any resistance as far as the border of the fire country. We will deal with their forward camp soon, he said with a strong voice. Sakura slowly woke up with a terrible headache. It became clear that the hospital ceiling was white. As she tried to sit up, she thought, I keep ending up here. She frowned when she saw the IV tube in her arm. Two plastic bags were hung up to give her water. She saw that one of the smaller bags was empty. She knew from the label that it was something that would help her sleep. She first looked at herself. She was hurt all over from fighting and running for so long. As the thought of being tortured ran through her mind, she looked over her shoulder. Sakura was glad to see that the flesh had healed, with only a few white lines showing where the cuts had been. She thought of medical ninjutsu. After that, she looked around the room. A well-known head of blonde hair with spikes was lying next to her in bed. The same room again. She thought with a hint of a laugh, they must think we're dating or something. From what she could see, the boy was just sleeping, so she left him alone. It took a while for the pink-haired teen to press the nurse call button. Soon, a nurse came in smiling. She smiled and began to take the needles out of Sakura's arm. You're up earlier than we thought you would be, she said. Since you are up, you won't be needing these anymore. 
I do ask that you remain in the hospital overnight. We have a problem with ninja having an annoying tendency to get up and leave whenever they feel like it. Sakura just said, yes. She asked in a polite way, could I get something to eat? I haven't eaten in some time. With a smile, the nurse left the room and came back with a cold sandwich and some milk. This is from our nurse's lounge. Patients are not supposed to get it but after hearing what you went through, you deserve it. Sakura was shocked and got a little red in the face. I asked, oh, thank you. So this is the main hospital, right? When the nurse said it was Sakura, she went on. My friend Ino, has she gotten any better? The nurse stopped and looked at me with a strange look on her face. She has not woken yet, but there have been a few um a complications. Sasakai asked eagerly, may I go visit for a minute? I promise to be quiet. Before she looked at the door, the nurse thought, I really can't let you go see her, even though her room is right next to yours. I need to go do my rounds, the nurse said with a smile as she left. Sakura didn't do anything else to stop the nurse from leaving. She was just telling her something. But she also couldn't stop Sakura from going in herself since she wouldn't give her permission. The girl with pink hair got out of bed, and her still sore body almost made her feel bad about it. She pushed herself to keep going and took a quick look out into the hallway. Normally, an Anbu would have been watching the door, but because of the emergency, they were all sent to do other tasks that were more important. She ran to Ino's door and peered in as quickly as she could. Her green eyes got bigger. Sometimes the beds are far apart, but now they were pulled together and held in place by what looked like sand. But that didn't make her look stand out much. She looked at the comatose hands of Ino and Gara and how their fingers were tangled together. Konoha sent four Anbu teams on a lightning-fast raid on the Sound Bandits camp halfway to the border before dawn the next morning, after the invasion had failed. The raid didn't spare anyone. Anbu had kept good records of the sentry positions while they watched the camp for weeks. It wasn't long before over 100 bandits and sound ninja died peacefully after the lookouts were killed. The Hokage planned to keep the camp whole so that it could be used as a base for patrols in the northern half of the Fire Country. He suggested that the legions and he work together on a staffing plan, which was accepted because bandits and sound ninja were still a threat. The daimyo would get a lot of money when trade routes with the rice fields country were opened up again. Kat looked around at the people who were cleaning up the bodies at the campsite. She used to be proud to do work like this for Konoha. She thought back to something she had said months ago after this morning. We're ninja. That's what we do. Being all showy and having flashy jutsu is for the elites. They kill sometimes but not often. Elites make ninja look less like a covert strike force than we really are. Public relations is one thing but you don't honestly think the classes in killing were just for show did you? Sakura said, well no but you make it sound like you were buying groceries or something. Not really, but the day it becomes like buying groceries is the day you need to stop doing it and get out, Yugo said gently. Kat looked at the pile of dead bodies on fire. Like getting groceries, she said in a low voice. After the fight, Serutobi looked over his list of people who had been promoted. Most of the work had been done by the military part of the ninja force. Each unit commander had to send in a list of all the ninjas in their section, along with the current and proposed ranks for each one. Being able to see that most of his forces were getting better at training made Serutobi happy. Dozens of people were up for promotion from Jenin to Chunin based on how well they could fight and lead their squad. In some cases, whole squads were told to be sent. He smiled when he saw that the group that had saved Team 8 in the Forest of Death was there too. The third member who lost quickly to the Sound Ninja was added to help the team get better. At that time, he was in charge of that group of people. They both offered to stay Jenin with him if he wasn't promoted, since he had always been in charge of them. His record wasn't hurt by the extra recommendation of the captain of an Anbu squad either. The Hokage agreed with the suggestions. Serutobi frowned as he saw that a few older genin had been suggested, with cause, for, duties not related to combat. Those he signed off on without any doubt. It was clear that if someone under his command did not meet expectations, they only had one chance to fix the problem. Going on warehouse guard duty wasn't fun but it was seen as a sign that you had to meet those standards again or leave. People said that a few Chunin should be tested for Jonin rank. He smiled at this. In the military arm, they were short on Jonin. We'd like more. 
A note was made by Serutobi to have those ninja closely watched by Jonin who were already in the military and in the elite wings. The next group he would deal with were the elites. He was the one who made the final decision about any promotions. Some of the older elite Chunin who were not likely to become Jonin would be moved up in the military to command squads. They would be the Hokage's eyes and ears when it came to finding great talent that the academy's screening process had missed. If clan ninjas thought that might happen, they usually retired to start families and keep the clan going. Many of them wouldn't agree to the move because they saw it as a step down. Five military Chunin, one Jonin, and two elite Chunin were asked by Anbu to be allowed to train for their ranks. Before giving the order, Serutobi looked over the ninja in question service records. Then, Anbu would offer those ninjas a spot in their training program, and the people who were asked would decide whether to accept or reject the offer. Anbu did not force anyone to join, but those who did get in did so after being carefully screened and making the choice to join on their own. Not many people turned down the offer. Amino Uruka was the last person to say no instead, he asked to be sent to the academy, where he would become the youngest teacher there. The elite genin were the last group on the list. They were always a small group, but missions with a lot of attention made them a lot of money. Some of the most powerful genin in the village sent them on missions that had to do with public relations or diplomacy. Not only did they have the highest standards for promotion, but they also had to be held to a higher level of success because they would one day lead clans and Konoha as a whole. Because Ino and Hinata were hurt, they were both put on reserve. This meant that two teams were left unfinished and stuck. To keep the money coming in, the Hokage had to change how things were set up. He also had to take care of his personal team. In spite of his hopes, it didn't work either. He sighed and took out his elite ninja's private notes. It could take a while. Naruto woke up with the sun on his face and got ready for the day. For a week, he had to clean up the battle area and was sore every night. He laughed when a military side ninja walked by and told him he missed a spot. It was also where some of his old classmates from both the academy and the remedial program were. One thing the Hokage always made sure of was that the elites helped clean up the village. Even though it wasn't much, the military was happy to see the elites get dirty, on d rank missions, so it was worth it. From the beginning of Konoha's history, people who want to lead had to serve first. Naruto even forgot that the old man had told him not to put Sakura and him in the D-ranks, so he let it go. The old man looked a little stressed, and the blonde didn't want to be the one to go against orders and have to deal with the consequences. Yesterday, Kakashi told him that the team was going to a meeting with all the other elite genin. Even though they were new, they could see where their teams were weak. The Jonin told them to be on time and said that this meeting would change things. Since last month, the Jonin who looked like a scarecrow hadn't spent much time in front of the memorial stone. But this morning, he felt the need to do so. His thoughts kept going back to the events of the past week. Near sunset on the day of the failed invasion, a recovery team found him and Sasakai in bed. They went back to the village the next morning to meet up with Naruto and Sakura again. It was Ibiki and the Hokage who were at the mission debriefing because they were directly under the Hokage's command. For once, the Jonin had been completely honest about how he felt about what he and his team had done during the whole thing. He made sure that even Sasakai paid attention to the report by Sakura and Naruto as they fought their way back and tried to get away from the Sand Forces. At the point where Sakura was captured, the leader stopped the debriefing and only said that Jiraiya had stepped in to bring the two back to Konoha. He agreed with this. Sasakai and Sakura both wanted to know those details, but the leader said he already had Jiraiya's and didn't need any more right now. Kakashi wrote down the time, he didn't want to be late for this meeting because it was almost noon. That was how fast Sakura walked to the Hokage Tower. She had a lot of time, but she needed to get to the meeting early. Even though it had been a long week, she was still sore, which was nice. She had become a strong Kunoichi through training and hard times. She liked the looks that some older teens had given her, and the slight looks from some regular people didn't bother her anymore. The military ninjas all smiled and nodded at her, but they didn't say a word. People who were interested knew that she had a foot in both the military and the elite world. A lot of people talked about what happened the night before the invasion, and she and Naruto couldn't get away from them. All of them had been heard in some way by the ranks, it turned out that the teen with pink hair was now seen as even more dangerous. 
The wildest rumor said that they had killed hundreds of San Janan with just a toothpick and some dental floss. A senior Janan had already said that all of the elites should take the remedial course if they kept doing well like that. The Hokage told them he would think about it. She was excited to find out what the meeting would be about. There were no elite missions, and this meeting of all the elite genin wasn't something that happened very often. She got there 30 minutes early and was the first person in the room. She found a comfortable seat on one side where she could see all the doors at once and settled down. She thought of the conversation she had with Naruto after getting out of the hospital a few nights before. Sakura knocked on Naruto's apartment door so loudly that it woke him up. The boy asked her to come over tonight after she asked him about the red eyes and scent they had while running from the sand at night. Naruto looked sad, but he agreed to talk to her. The blonde teen made her sit on his used couch while he spoke slowly. To begin, he asked her what she knew about sealing. That part came to her quickly, she was shocked when he came out and told her what happened next. Sakura, the day I was born, the Kyubi attacked Konoha. The fourth didn't die killing it. He died sealing it into the only thing that could keep it captive. A newborn baby, me. Since that day, the Kyubi no Yoko has been held locked away inside a seal on my stomach. Sakura was shocked, but her mind quickly processed the information. That's why Naruto got better so quickly, had more chakra than the Hokage, and was picked on by so many people. The thought of Naruto having a demon locked up inside him shocked her, but it shocked the boy even more. She could tell he thought she would say no to him. In the future, she would say he was the devil and refused to work with him. She stood up to Naruto instead and gave him a hug, telling him, Thank you, Naruto. Thank you for protecting us all. There was no more talk about it, it wasn't necessary. People coming into the briefing room were making her think less clearly. Aged teens came in and sat down together, she saw. She shook when she saw one boy in a green spandex unitard and bowl cut. Naruto came in after another team, and she waved him over. He smiled and sat down next to her, soon after, Sasakai showed up. The boy with dark hair looked like he hadn't slept since the invasion failed. He looked a lot like that sand kid Gara because of the dark circles under his eyes. He just gave them a nod and then sat down next to Naruto like any other guy would. The pairs from Team 8 and Team 10 also sat nearby with their Jonin sensei. Kiba wore light braces on his arms to support the bones that were being healed by Chakra until they got stronger on their own. As noon got closer, some older genin found their way in. One of the last people to arrive was Kakashi. Then the Hokage came in and stood in front of the room. Satoku said, I'm glad everyone is on time for this meeting. As you all know, solid teamwork is the basis of most of Konoha's success and good reputation. Recent events mean we need to rearrange a few teams. Other events during the attack by the Sound Village also will have an impact on team formation. Many of the genin here are on the cusp of promotion to Chunin but need a little more experience before that is granted. The interrupted exams left us unable to fully evaluate some of you so no promotions will come directly from that. I will however, ask your John and sensei for recommendations in three months on all of you. Seru Tobi told the older teams about some changes. Surprisingly, he then fired everyone except the teams for this year and Team Guy. He spoke again after the older elite Genin had all left. The events involving Team 8 and Yamanaka Ino of Team 10 have left those two teams broken. Until the injured Kunoichi are able to return to duty, the following changes will be made. Hayuga Neji will be moved to Team 8. Tenten will be moved to Team 10. Guy shall continue as the sensei of Rock Lee. Now, those teams and instructors are dismissed. Guy yelled at Lee as he dragged him to the doorway. Burn with youth in your temporary assignments, my cute students. Come Lee. We shall run ten laps around Konoha to celebrate Tenten and Neji spreading their youth with others. He yelled, yes, Guy's sensei, as he was pulled along. It looked like Neji and Tenten were both a little happier as they left with their new teams. Kakashi and the original Team 7 were the only ones left, they were told to sit in the front row by the Hokage. The leader took a moment to look at each genin. I know the teamwork on this team is not where it should be. Uchiha Sasakai, you feel that you are being held back by this team, is that correct? The fact that the Hokage picked out Sasakai made him frown. In the week since that night, his feelings about his teammates had changed a little. They were very skilled, 
and even he couldn't argue with the distance they went and the number of enemies they hurt or killed while running. He didn't trust himself as much after that. He knew he had to get stronger to deal with his brother, but just how far he had to go was scary to him for the first time. The pink harpy and the blonde idiot kept getting better and were sometimes even better than he was. He didn't understand them, though. They would show him how good they were and then offer to be friends. It had happened many times in the last month. People kept trying to work with him even though he always turned them down. There was a part of him that knew they wanted to help him get better, but his pride wouldn't let him. Before he went to sleep, the words his brother had said kept going over and over in his head. You stupid little brother, if you want to kill me, hate me, still manage to stay alive in an ugly way. Run, run, and hold on to life. He had to get back at them, but the way his brother told him to do it wasn't making him stronger. It didn't work to hate. The fact that Pear got better proved that point beyond his narrow view. The last words kept going over and over in his head until a soft voice added one more line to the noise. Quit being mad. When you first joined Team 7, you said you wanted to start over with your clan and kill a certain person. Both of them are impossible for you to do by yourself. Sasakai, you'll have to ask for help sometime. Sasakai? The Hokage's voice asked with worry. Sasakai lifted his head from where he was holding it. He said in a whisper, brother did something to me. I, I need help with it. The memories stopped for a moment. The Hokage got on his knees and looked deeply into the Uchiha's dark eyes. Then he smiled. The old leader looked at Kakashi and said, then you shall have it, Sasakai. We have been waiting and hoping for years that you would ask for it. Kakashi, I know you would have liked to keep the team intact but this situation is one that needs addressing immediately. I want you to stay with Sasakai now and help him along. Can you go with Kakashi to go talk with a new counselor, Sasakai? We have one from the Yamanaka clan that has dealt with the effects of Uchiha eye techniques in the past. Sasakai took a look at them. Naruto and Sakura both looked like they were worried about him. Kakashi himself looked scared. People who liked him enough to think that, even though he didn't think of them as friends. He slowly said, yes. The happy approval smiles on four faces shocked him and made him feel good at the same time. Sasakai left to go with Kakashi. Hokage let out a sigh, though it didn't go as planned, it was better than what it could have been. What should he do with his awful pair now? I thought of another talk he had not long ago. He told Sakura and Naruto, come to my office, then he told his guard to get someone by making hand signs. The two of them walked quickly together. He walked right into his office, skipping over a few people who were waiting to see him. He gave them a small nod to let them know they were there. He had to make time to talk to the man because a message from the daimyo did not look good. Kat showed up in the office a few minutes later. She spoke from her knees, you sent for me, Hokage-sama. He said, yes, I had, Kat. I decided on your request from the other day and one you made previously. Are you still willing to serve as a teacher and squad leader for these genin? She asked, but what about Kakashi-senpei? Things have changed, Kat. The Uchiha boy has finally asked for help and I felt that overrides any other team concern. Kat looked at Naruto and Sakura and then nodded. I would be honored to work with them if they wanted me. As I told you, they know how I look but not who I really am. He turned to look at the genin. I know this is sudden and not something planned on. You were both learning to deal with Kakashi but you both will learn a great deal from Kat. If you have any reservations on this assignment, tell me now. First, Sakura nodded, I have none, Hokage-sama. Kat has already helped me and I have no issues with her command. Naruto thought for a moment and then nodded. I'm fine, Hokage-sama. The old leader gave a nod. The three of you will act as a three-person team. If additional personnel are needed for an assignment, they will be added. We shall hammer out the fine points later on. I have a number of appointments waiting so go discuss things somewhere else. Dismissed. The new group left the room quickly. Kat showed them a way to get to a simple building that went around and around. Another masked Anbu showed up at the entrance. Man moved out of the way to let the three people in after hearing Kat's whisper. We can talk here, she said as she took off her mask. This is one of our trainee locker rooms. Sakura and Naruto were very patient while they waited for Yugo to start. As she thought, the woman ran her fingers through her long purple hair. Okay, 
My name is Azuki Yugo. My rank is Jonin but I am officially a member of Anbu. That remains unchanged. I had requested to be the Jonin sensei for the pair of you after the root incident but Hokage-sama had other ideas. Recent events had led me to asking to be released from masked Anbu service. For a moment, the genin looked worried, but then she turned her attention to Sakura. It became like getting groceries, Sakura. The girl with pink hair just nodded to show that she got it and then whispered to Naruto, I'll explain that later. Yugo went on. I am not sure how things will go for us. I never taught before but for the most part we will be doing missions and improving teamwork early on. The remedial classes took care of most of the basics. I can add in some more powerful jutsu as we figure out what kind would suit each of you. I have a boyfriend but that won't interfere with missions. You'll meet him eventually. I'm not sure what else but I'm sure we can figure it out as we go. Naruto and Sakura both said their names, but Yugo already knew most of it. When Sakura talked about Naruto's stomach problem, she smiled and thought that would make things a lot easier. As he looked through the hole in the fence around the hot springs, Jiraiya laughed like a schoolgirl. At the women he was writing down about, he thought, this is the best place for hot babes. As he wrote, he thought about different plots. Someone said, hey, pervert, from behind him. Jiraiya quickly put his notes away and then looked back. Getting caught in his research was nothing new to him. Saving his work always came before facing the consequences of what he did. He turned around without a fuss to see who had caught him this time. When he saw that all three of them were looking at him, his face almost broke. Blonde and pink hair on either side of purple hair. His memory quickly told him who his enemies were. So, Sensei's newest plan is to hurt his best student. Now it's time to act stupid. Jiraiya jumped over the fence and landed behind the three people. I am not just a pervert. I am Jiraiya, the toad sage, and I am a super pervert, the man with white hair said as he started to dance in a strange way. I am the legend that makes women's dreams come true. I am famous all over the world. Yugo pushed him back, ending his song and dance. Can you do it, Jiraiya-sama? She barked. I know what you are and if it were not for my students I would be trying to carve you up right now. He pretended to be confused and asked, students? Yugo gave a wry smirk. Yes, students. I know Hokage-sama briefed you and you met them already so please for both of our sakes, drop the charade. We need to speak in private. Jiraiya almost didn't notice the man nod before whispering, training field 11. The man then ran off laughing like crazy. You will never catch the great Jiraiya. When Yugo waved for Naruto and Sakura to follow, the three of them ran off in a different direction. A few minutes later, Jiraiya joined them in a training area that was away from everyone else. Jiraiya asked in a dark voice, Cat, what's so important that you need to talk to me? The change in the man's behavior caught both Naruto and Sakura by surprise. At first, he looked like a fool, but now, he looked so dangerous that both of them were scared. Yugo pointed to Sakura and Naruto and said, First, my students had something they wanted to say to you. As Sakura spoke, both of the genin bowed formally. Thank you for rescuing us from those sand janin, Jiraiya-sama. Without your aid we would be dead right now. The white-haired man didn't blush because people rarely thanked him for his work. He was used to being yelled at and chased in his cover more than being thanked for anything. He said in a quiet voice, you're both very welcome. Being thanked made him feel good, and helping Minato's boy was an added bonus. He wasn't a good godfather to the boy, but he had to do what was right for the village first. So, tell me about yourselves, the toad sage asked. She smiled when she saw all of them. The talks she had with Hiro had taught her a lot. The man had only given her hints, but her quick mind quickly put everything together. The first clue was the boy's name. Shippu, the Anbu hero, was the only Uzumaki in the village. Shippu was unique in that he never failed at a mission and nothing bad ever happened. Before she went on Hokage protection duty, Hiro had served with her squad for his first year. After a year, Shippu quit and was nowhere to be found. Soon after that, Hiro was put in charge of protecting the pregnant redhead woman who was seen with the Yandaimi. Anbu doesn't keep many secrets, so she knew Naruto was the one who had the Kayubi. She was his mother, and she was a redhead, so the father was a blonde. After that, the pieces fit together quickly. 
it wasn't hard to figure out who the boy's father was. The Jonin with purple hair kept all of these thoughts to himself, but he was interested in hearing Naruto talk about the battles and the Sandfoss's night chase. Jiraiya-sama, Kakashi-sensei had used something called a shadow clone. What is that? The boy asked. Gigi used the name one once too. The boy made Sakura want to hit him, but she was also interested in the jutsu once it was brought up. Before taking a quick look at Yugo, Jiraiya gave her a thoughtful look. The Jonin gave a small nod. Well, I do know what that is. It is a special type of clone that creates a solid copy of the person. It has limited awareness and is able to cast jutsu. When it is dispelled, the person gets the memories and experience of the clone so it is a useful jutsu for gathering and passing on information. It is considered forbidden as the chakra cost is prohibitive. You need a minimum of Jonin level control or reserves to use it at all without killing yourself. Naruto's eyes almost lit up when he heard about the new jutsu and thought about it. Please, Jiraiya-sama, could I learn it from you? Naruto asked the sage with white hair. The sage laughed. The man laughed even more and said, puppy eyes? Geez, that only works for girls. After mumbling for a moment, Naruto looked at Sakura and said, please don't hit me for this. She rolled her eyes. Whatever, just this once. Naruto waved his hand, and with a puff of chakra smoke, he changed. She was naked, and she had blonde hair. She looked at Jiraiya with puppy eyes and a cute pout. Please Jiraiya-sama. When the toad sage saw the blonde goddess naked in front of him, he was shocked and weak from the beauty of her. As he fell back in a fit of lust, blood poured out of his nose. Naruto lost his special jutsu and laughed so hard that he almost fell to the ground. He then pointed to Jiraiya, who was already on the ground. Even though Sakura rolled her eyes again, she did nothing and watched as the great Jiraiya calmed down. Well, I guess I could teach you the jutsu if your teacher approves, he said. As Sarutobi looked at the two mission requests on his desk, he thought, when it rains, it pours. Because his cousin had said he would be at the Chunin exams several months ago, the daimyo asked for a spy mission to the Land of Wave to find out why his cousin had not shown up. Also, the daimyo hadn't heard back from anyone recently about his letters. He thought there was something bad going on in Wave Country, so he asked Konoha to find out what it was. Seru Tobi remembered the event from months ago in which the younger Jonin Sensei, the bridge builder from Wave, and a group of Genin were killed. The deaths were being looked into by Anbu, but the killers have not been found. The bodies were cut up into pieces. After several days of bad weather and animals scavenging the bodies, there was no more useful evidence. It was found that Wave had not even been able to get into the country. The daimyo of Wave had ordered that all boats that could get to the mainland be taken away. From now on, the only way in or out was over the new bridge. The Gato Corporation bought the ruler's unfinished span and finished it. All ninja were also told they couldn't come into the country once the Wave Daimyo's order was over. The old leader thought this was too much of a coincidence. He thought, the whole series of events around Root left me with no choice at the time but to let the case of the dead squad grow cold. This Daimyo mission could easily turn into something bigger, he said. The second ask came from Hayuga Hiyashi. Because of how his injuries were hurt, Hanada had to look for other ways to heal them. Someone had to find Senju Tsunade, who was a student of the Sandame and one of the best doctors in history, and get her to treat the heiress. People said she had jutsu that could even fix damage done to the mind by the Sharingan. It was important for Hayuga to do two things. The first would be to find the last student of the Hokage. The second was getting the woman to agree to go back to Konoha, she promised herself she would never go back to the village while she was still alive. The situation with the Hanada was also getting worse. Elder Hyuga people would not give up on their plan to have Hanabi, who was younger and easier to control, take Hanada's place as heiress. With their pending blood debt claims on Hanada, the Inazuka and Aburame had slowed down their plans. Hayashi was stuck in the middle. He did not want either of his daughters to be branded but his position as leader of the Hyuga clan was becoming at best weak. The only way to make things better was for Hanada to be mentally and physically healthy and able to face the elders. Serutobi scowled and reached for his pen to tell his ninja what to do. I will continue the story in next part till then we weave offline.